morning, 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 everybody. How you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I'm Sean Butler. Bugsy Malone's just down here. This is episode 221 of Tottenham Walks, or the Spurs Walk Show. I hope you're all happy and healthy doing the things that you love, the people that you love doing them with. Please do me a favour, guys. Smash the like button like you always do. Hit the subscribe if you haven't already. And on that note, massive thank you to everyone who's been a part of the journey on this channel. We hit 8K yesterday and it's only been three weeks since we hit 7K. The growth has been insane of late. Obviously, it's in no small part down to a renewed interest in Tottenham from people that are in the, I guess, Tottenham fan base that may or may not spend too much time on YouTube that now do because of the prospect of witnessing Ange Ball for four years. So welcome to all the news. Welcome back to all the olds. I really appreciate and love every one of you. Thanks for hanging around and let's see where we can go with this. Whilst you're at it, guys, hit the notification bell and please drop a comment on this video and every other. Let me know your thoughts. Let's get on with today's transfer news, views and clues. Let's start at the bottom end of the pitch, David Raya. I know I've spoken about him every day, but just to give you the latest, essentially Manchester United and Tottenham have apparently both been in agreement that he's not worth 40 million quid and that Brentford are saying, well, they are going to hold out for 40. They're not going to accept anything less than that. We've already spoken about how the agent of... David Raya is saying that he will tell David Raya to run down his contract unless he can get a more realistic transfer fee. For me personally, like if the if the, the the difference is between 20 and 40 million, I'd ask the question: How much is Harry Kane worth to Tottenham, and how much is he worth to someone else? Given how indispensable he is as a player and how difficult it's going to be to replace him, you're going to make the argument as a Tottenham fan that he's probably worth 100 million quid or north. But to Real Madrid today he's only worth £70 million, or well, that's the initial first bid that apparently is going to be presented. So I'd ask the question, if David Rea is worth 40 and Harry Kane is worth 80, is it reasonable to say that one Harry Kane is worth two David Rea's? I don't think so. I think that David Rea is incredibly important, and for what it's worth, I think he's an amazing goalkeeper. I think he ticks every box right, for the Postacoglu system. He's great with his agility, his reflex saves, his communication, his commanding presence in the box, his ability to come and get the ball in the air, but more importantly, his ability to play the sweeper-keeper and the distribution that he has, the skill set within his feet, is incredible, and we will need someone like him. To me, £40 million for such a key cog is not that eye-watering, it's not that much money. Thomas Frank said the only reason he's worth 40 is because his contract is running down, and that if he had a longer on his contract, he would be worth 70 million. And he uses Kepa as the example. He said, how much did Kepa cost? Right? He thinks that David Rea is at least as good as Kepa, and I take the point. But the reality is that the contract is where it is. And if Harry Kane is only worth 100 million quid, with all of the goals that he can score and all of the value that he can provide, you have to make the, the, the judgment of whether or not David Rea's value is relatively correct at 40 million pound. And I'm not sure where the, the truth is because I do look at how many mistakes Hugo Lloris made last year, how many points that they probably cost us. And I think that if you have David Rea in goal, how many points do we not lose? How many goals do we not concede? And I land somewhere on the point that I don't, he's probably, if Harry Kane probably is worth 100, maybe David Rea isn't worth 40, maybe he's worth 30. Maybe I'm kind of leaning into the common sense or the logic of what both Manchester United and Tottenham agree that on the valuation of. However, when you look at how many clubs are probably going to be interested in David Rea, I think sometimes you've got to see the wood for the trees. Keep your eye on the bigger picture and rather than getting lost in the minutiae. And to me, David Rea is so important. So even if he's not worth £40 million relative to the transfer market, relative to people like Harry Kane, when you think about what he'll go for, at the end of the day, we need someone like him. He is available for a specific fee. And you can't always get what you want at the correct valuation. Sometimes you just have to pay a little bit more to get it done and to make sure that you are not gazumped by one of your competition. So even if he's not worth 40, I implore Daniel Levy to pay it, pay what's necessary, get it done early because then we can move up the field and focus on the other areas that are just as important and that take up just as much time to get these deals done. Hanging around and pissing around 
over negotiations over a couple of million can end up wasting time, which means you end up losing out on players that are also necessary to make this jigsaw work. So let's move up the pitch now. No news today on any defenders that I can talk about. So we're going to skip the defenders, we're going to skip the DMs, and we're going to move up to the attacking midfielder role and the forward line. A few stories here, just quickly. Giovanni Lo Celso has apparently told his agent to tell Tottenham Hotspur he has no interest in coming back to Tottenham. He doesn't want to come to Tottenham. He either wants to transfer away somewhere else or stay in Spain. To me, either event is fine. There is also news that Monchi, the Seville director of football that we mentioned yesterday that was linked to Tottenham, well, this morning there are strong links, stronger links, and it makes a bit more sense for me, this one, for him to join Unai Emery at Aston Villa. So there's a bit of a Spanish armada happening over in Birmingham at the moment. And if Monchi does join um, Aston Villa, then I, I would hazard a guess that it would make a lot of sense, a lot more sense for Giovanni Lo Celso to potentially go to Aston Villa and join up with Unai Emery um, because I believe, I'm not sure, I could be wrong about this, but I believe I read somewhere a couple of days ago that Giovanni Lo Celso's agent is the same agent as Monchi from Seville, the director of football. So maybe, just maybe, there is logic to that and method to that madness and it would be not something that I'd have any problem with. I know usually we don't like the idea of selling our players to rivals, and I guess you would consider Aston Villa a rival and something like on a similar kind of playing field to Tottenham at the moment. But in the case of Lo Celso, I just don't particularly see the value in him. I don't particularly see his style of football suiting the Premier League. But if Unai Emery does and Monchi was to go to, to Villa and they could make that kind of happen and pull the strings utilising their various relationships, then that's fine with me. Get him out of the way, try and bring in 15 million quid or something, put that towards the transfer budget. The next story is Manor Solomon, Shakhtar Donetsk, inside forward, currently plying his trade. Morning, guys. Currently plying his trade at Fulham, and he's been on a loan, but he's still technically employed by Shakhtar Donetsk. But of course, with the FIFA and UEFA rules, I'm not sure if it was FIFA or UEFA that made this rules, but they put in the stipulation that because of what's happening in the Ukraine that any player that plays for Shakhtar Donetsk or any other Ukrainian club, I believe can once again leave, leave their Ukrainian clubs on a free and sign with any club they want. Manuel Solomon's been linked with Tottenham and the story is that the Shakhtar Donetsk owner or the chairman has come out and said, if Manuel Solomon signs for Tottenham, then he will sue Tottenham. And I'm not entirely sure how that works. The only reason Tottenham would sign him is because of a rule that was put in place by the governing bodies of footballing associations. Not because they're breaking the rules, but because they're taking advantage of the rules that are being put in place by FIFA or UEFA. So I'm not entirely sure how Tottenham would end up in court. But in any event, I guess we can move the conversation from will it happen to should it happen? What are your thoughts on Solomon? Do you like him as a player? I'm pretty sure he just had like a very, like a hot spell at Fulham, where I think he scored like four or five goals in four or five games and everyone was suddenly talking about him. But I think that was the grand total of all the goals that he scored or very close to all the goals that he scored last season. I think he's a good player. I think he's a tricky player. And to play off the left-hand side, the inside forward role, Look, we are going to need someone in that role to, to be able to replace you know, either Dan Juma or Lucas Moura. We had this conversation on Henry Wright yesterday. Harvey Barnes has been linked. But you know what? If Harvey Barnes is going to cost 30 million quid and he's just going to come in and probably play second fiddle to Sonny again, then do you want to absorb 30 million quid, whatever that is, 20%, 30% of the transfer budget on a player who doesn't play or get anywhere near enough minutes to justify it? We've had this situation with Richarlison. We spent 50% of our budget on a player that sat on the bench most of the season. I don't want Tottenham to waste money when money will be limited and the holes are everywhere 
I don't want us to waste precious budget or too much precious budget on players that are not going to be immediately impacting the first team. And I just feel, feel like Sonny, not only does he have the gravitas, the brand, the kind of the, the points in the locker, that even last season when he had terrible form, he was barely dropped. I personally believe that his style is going to suit the Postacoglu system. I think he's going to have a much better year next year. And absent any injuries, I don't necessarily think that he will be rotated as much as you know competition for places that may exist in other areas. So if you're looking at who do we go and get to fit that inside forward role for the person who's rotating with Sonny, I don't think Manuel Solomon's a fantastic player. I think he's a good player and I think he offers something that that is interesting. Putting aside all of the legalities and the worries about being sued, as a free transfer, it makes a lot of sense because you can fill the hole with quality but not take up the budget. And so whilst I think that someone like Harvey Barnes is a better player, and generally speaking, I would prefer Harvey Barnes to Solomon, personally, I don't want to see us spend all that money on a player that doesn't get the minutes to justify it. So moving away from Solomon, moving away from Lo Celso, but staying in the same area, the last story of the day, guys, and I've kept this one for last because, well, I just wanted you to hang around until, until I got to this particular part. But there are links out all across the aggregators that it started with a media, what I've read is tier 1.5, Portuguese media, and I don't know how you say the name, but I think it's Fijaces or something like that. <laughs> Uh, a Portuguese media that is linking, get ready, <laughs> João Felix, or João Felix, depending on how good you are at pronunciation, to Tottenham Hotspur. His super agent, I think it's George Mendes, I'm pretty sure it is, has been put to work, sent to work, because Diego Simeone's relationship with Felix, Felix is you know, unquestionably rough at the moment, apparently, uh, as far as I've read. And that, you know, Felix doesn't really suit the Atletico Madrid's playing style, but he is a phenomenal player. And that he isn't going to stay at Chelsea. Chelsea are not going to uh, take up the option, apparently. As I mentioned before, I think that the cows are coming home to roost a little bit. As I mentioned before, I think the chickens are coming home to roost a little bit with regards to Chelsea's financial situation. I think that they are starting to have to kind of rein it in a little bit and make sacrifices with some of the players that they've that they've looked at they can't keep spending money like it's going out of fashion and according to reports Felix is not going to be signed permanently by Chelsea and that the links are all over the Premier League that Newcastle United are very much interested that Aston Villa again are very much interested and that Tottenham are very much interested Apparently Arsenal are not interested in this particular one and that Tottenham are emerging as front runners for the Postacoglu system. Now, João Felix for me, obviously we know he's a phenomenal player, an absolutely phenomenal player. The talent in this guy's feet, his footwork, his creativity, his passing range is sublime. I don't think he really hit the ground running at Chelsea, but I don't think anybody's really hit the ground running at Chelsea. A lot of talent, but no kind of cohesiveness, no real team like uh, organization. Lots of stars, but no spirit sort of thing. But at Tottenham, do I see it, mate? Do I see it fitting? Look, I think mean, there's lots of problems with it. First and foremost, he absolutely could fit into the half space, right? He could fit into that into that that role that Rio Hatati plays. He could even fit in the role that is played by Matt O'Reilly at Celtic. It's, you know either one of those two number eights. You could even make the argument, if Harry Kane was to leave, that he could sit in the nine. But again, I don't think the nine is best served. If you want to emulate Chelsea's uh, Celtic system to a T, then whoever sits in the nine is, again, like I say, a sacrificial lamb a lot of the time in build-up. And I don't necessarily know if you want to have a player like Harry Kane or João Felix who is that good, but is that is not utilised for all of their gifts, like the number nine, how the number nine is used uh, in a Postacoglu system at Celtic. 
he can fit in a half space. Look, the problem with the idea for me is the cost. I think he's on 260, 250 grand a week. He would immediately come in as the highest earner in the club, I think. Harry Kane's on 250, so I think it would be about the same. And of course the fee, how much would the fee be? Well, 60 million, 70 million might be, morning guys, 60, 70 million might be the touted fee, which is a cut price from what Atletico Madrid paid for him just a couple of years ago. But I think when you also include the fact that George Mendes is involved, he'll want his slice and his slice is usually incredibly juicy. So to be entirely honest, if there's rumours that he's going to stay in the Premier League, the chances of him coming to Tottenham, I put the story at a two out of 10. I just don't think Tottenham are going to be going out and buying marquee signings quite like that. I would love it if it was possible, if it was plausible. Maybe that would be the way. The only other part of the story that I guess you could see happening is if Harry Kane is sold to Real Madrid, is that a way that Tottenham would then pivot and go and try and replace Harry Kane with a marquee signing like him? But in all honesty, if he's going to go anywhere in the Premier League, I think when you hear Eddie Howe saying things like he's going to make three marquee signings this summer, and he actually used the word marquee, who does that unless they're confident they're going to get some big names in? That would be overly unnecessarily exciting the Newcastle fans. And maybe someone like Jao Felix will be a perfect fit for an Eddie Howe system that needs to now be kind of merged and, and pivoted and then kicked on to hit those next levels that they want to hit. So I don't think Jao Felix is particularly likely, but... It's out there in the mainstream media and allegedly Fajesh is a, a, you know, a very decent top tier candidate in, in Portuguese media. So I thought I'd bring it to your attention. Let me know your thoughts, guys. Well, that is it from me. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, bye bye.